The world's, the world's writers will walk through those gates and uh, if you hang around you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. But kindness is looking at people as people and not as, I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. My name is Raja Shahadi. I've been participating in the Edinburgh International Book Festival for many years. The festival has been central to my development as a writer. The thrill I feel as I enter Charlotte Square has never waned. I could always count on excellent programming and stimulating discussions. There has never been a time when such meetings are more important. We were looking for novels that had a really clear and potent voice that haunted us and stayed with us. We were looking for novels that were incredibly well translated. Literature is the one art form that puts us completely in somebody else's shoes. It's the supreme act of empathy, as crucial to the survival of the human spirit as water or air. Welcome to the world in words. Hello everybody and welcome to this rather strange new iteration of the Edinburgh International Book Festival. My name is Stuart Kelly, I'm a writer and literary critic and it's a privilege to be here with Daniel Kelman and his translator Ross Benjamin to discuss this book, Till. It's one of the most astonishing books I've read this year. Um, We'll talk more about the specifics of it later, but I think to begin with, we ought to have a virtual hand clap and hear a bit from the book. Daniel. Yeah, I'll uh, thank you very much. It's great to to be part of this. And uh, yeah, I will just read the first paragraph in the original German. It's a very short paragraph, so there won't be a lot of that. Uh, and then um, Ross will re read a little bit from his wonderful English translation. So it starts like this. Der Krieg war bisher nicht zu uns gekommen. Wir lebten in Furcht und Hoffnung und versuchten Gottes Zorn nicht auf unsere fest von Mauern umschlossene Stadt zu ziehen mit ihren 105 Häusern und der Kirche und dem Friedhof wo unsere Vorfahren auf den Tag der Auferstehung warteten. And I'll read from a passage toward the middle. Our main characters, uh, Till and, and Nela, his companion, um, have um, apprenticed themselves to a uh, traveling entertainer. 
and this is about um, their time with that entertainer, who's a, a balladeer. Nele noticed at the very outset that he was not good. But only now, hearing Gottfried perform the song about the devilish miller in front of the crowd in the market town, does it become clear to her that they have stumbled on the worst balladeer of all. He sings much too high, and sometimes he clears his throat in the middle of a line. When he speaks, his voice still sounds all right. Yet when he sings, it cracks and squeaks. The voice by itself would not be bad if he could only carry a tune. Just as the poor singing would not be so bad if he could at least play the lute. Gottfried incessantly plays the wrong notes, and sometimes he forgets how the rest of the song goes. But even this would not be so unbearable if only his verses were better. They tell of the wicked miller and the village he had under his thumb, of his witcheries and tricks. Yet although they are as rich in grisly stories and bloody details as people expect, they are jumbled and hard to understand. And the rhymes are so awkward that it must bother even a child. Still, the people listen. Balladeers don't come often, and people want to hear ballads about witch trials, even when they're terrible. But after four verses, Nela can see that their expressions are changing. And by the time he has arrived at the 12th and last, many have left. Now there's an urgent need for something that will go over better. This much he must know, thinks Nela. This much he must be able to sense. Gottfried starts the song from the beginning. He notices the restlessness in the people's faces, and in his desperation, he sings louder, which makes his voice even shriller. Nela looks over at Till. He rolls his eyes. Then he spreads his arms in a resigned gesture. Light-footedly, he leaps beside the singer and begins to dance on the wagon. The improvement is immediate. Gottfried is singing as badly as before, but suddenly it no longer matters. Till is dancing as if he had been trained. He's dancing as if his body had no weight and as if there were no greater pleasure. He leaps and spins and leaps again as if he hadn't just lost everything. And it's so infectious that a few members of the audience and then another few and then more and more begin to dance too. Now coins are flying over. Nela gathers them up. Gottfried sees it too and in his relief he now manages better to keep the rhythm. Till is dancing with such abandon and such light determination that watching him, Nela could almost forget that the song is about his father. Miller is rhymed with dealer, devil with shovel, fire with fear, and night with night, for this word is constantly repeated, dark night, black night, which is night. From the fifth verse on, it's about the trial, the stern and virtuous judges, God's mercy, the punishment that in the end befalls every evildoer, despite all Satan's maneuvers under the eyes of his accusers and the gallows on which the wicked Miller must breathe his last while the devil stands aghast. Till doesn't stop dancing during all this for they need the coins they have to eat. Thank you both very much indeed. I should apologize that there is some rain coming down in my conservatory. So you may hear some background noise, but I'm fairly sure that you've been at the book festival before when there's been a bit of rain. And can I say that doing this from home means at least I have a comfortable chair this year. <laughs> Daniel, to begin with, the whole series of stories about Till Ullenspiegel are not very well known in Britain compared to Faustus or to the stories of the Brothers Grimm. What attracted you to writing about this chancer, this person who is the fool who is wiser than the wise? Uh, yeah, it's 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 true. It, it's it must be a fundamentally different book for British or American readers than it is for German or Dutch readers, for example, um, because. Over here, for us, he's really, uh, well, even household name doesn't quite cover it. He's a mythical character. He's a, in, in, I, I, I think you could compare him to Robin Hood, like someone whom really everybody knows in, 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 in German and, or Dutch um, uh, culture and partly also in, Fr in, in France. Um, actually, the first impulse for me was that I wanted to write 
uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to avoid the word about because a novel is not really about anything, but I wanted to write a novel set in the time of the wars of religion, of the 17th century, of the in the complete meltdown of, of, of civilization that happened in the 17th century. And um, I was really interested in the, what you could call the mind of early modernity, the, the, the pre-enlightenment mind. And so it was really more about the time the book is set in and about the 30 years war. And I was looking for some kind of character that I could use as a, a guide, some kind of character whom the reader could travel with to different places and situations and meet different people with. And I realized that that character would have to be uh, a vagrant. Uh, someone who doesn't belong to the social order, who is out, an outsider, because these were the only people who were actually traveling and were meeting different kind, completely different social uh, people from all kinds of social cla uh, classes. And then I had this, uh, then I realized um, if, I, if I'm looking for a, a vagrant or, or a jester, which of course is the most interesting kind of, of vagrant for a storyteller, I felt like the the great thing even when you're a writer is you can cast anybody. It's like you hire a director who has access to any actor he wants. As a writer, you have access to any mythical or legendary character you're interested in. And so I felt like why should I invent a jester when I have when I can summon the great mythical northern european jester character himself till Ulspiegel, and so uh, yeah that's what i did you've preempted the question i was going to ask which was which came first the 30 years war or doing a book about till and it's very strange the way in which the 30 years war like till is not something that really has much traction on the british imagination why do you think that might be? Oh, there's a very simple answer to that. Uh, because uh, the King of, of, of England uh, was one of the very few rulers who was intelligent enough to stay out of it. So uh, his, uh, his, his, uh, his, his daughter, the daughter of, of James II, the Elizabeth Queen. Stuart, she had a certain part in causing this war to happen, but her father, decided against helping his daughter and his son-in-law and for staying out of it. You could say for the good of his country, but I, that would be kind of an anachronistic thing. Doing anything for the good of his country, of, of their country wasn't something rulers were interested in in the 17th century, but for whatever reason, he stayed out of it. And so that total continental disaster that was the Thirty Years' War did not affect uh, England. England had other disasters, but not, th not that one. We'll come back to that topic in a while, but I just wanted to bring in Ross. Uh, in terms of the translation, when you read that passage there about the verses, how difficult was it to convey the, the texture of the German in English? And I have to say, it is a book which reads not like a translation, which I think is a very big compliment. Right. Yeah, I, it's, it's a passage like that is both difficult and fun. So it's difficult in terms of the linguistic challenge and how much work and um, uh, how, how vigorous the challenge is to actually come up with solutions. But it's not difficult in that it's not arduous to do because it's fun and inventive. Because a passage like that, where you need to really reinvent um, some of the effects of the original, like these these bad rhymes, these slant rhymes, and um, um, you have to come up with your own because um, typically the same words don't um, uh, count as bad rhymes in German as in English, or the the equivalents don't count. So you have to come up with your own that nonetheless fit the atmosphere, fit the content of the song. And uh, so that, that requires ingenuity or, or just um, um, trial and error. Um, and that can involve a lot of work, but it's not, um, 
it's fun work because it's it's playful and inventive. Um, yeah. And tell me, I mean, one thing which I worried over was the very name, Ullenspiegel. Mm -hmm. Ullenspiegel. Um, were you tempted to translate what the name might mean? Because there seems to be quite a lot of diversity of opinion about what the jester's name actually means. Yeah, um, I was never quite tempted to do that. I, and it may have to do with, I ha I, just over time in translations, I've, I've almost always resisted doing something like that. Um, there, it's also, there are different traditions at different times in translation and at different eras and in different places. Like for a long time, the French always translated names, even like the name Georg, they would translate, I don't know if they still do this, you know, they would translate to Georges and, and the name, you know, whatever, Hans, whatever name, they would translate into the French equivalent of the name and, and go that far. Um, but with Eulenspiegel or Eulenspiegel, it's even more complex, like this, even this spelling that Daniel uses in this novel is not the only spelling out there. The etymology of the name is apocryphal anyway. Um, it's, it's thought to mean, it, it looks a lot like the words owl and mirror. And so there's this idea of owl mirror and that it combines the wisdom of the owl with holding a mirror up to society. But all of that is actually folk etymology, right, yes. Daniel? There's a more scatological word origin that's been discovered. Yeah. The real right? It's funny. It's, it's one of the many funny things surrounding that this, this character. I mean, not my character, but the old folktale character is that the name actually sounds very elegant and elegant in a postmodern way, as Ross just said, and, and a mirror, a mirror of the of the owl, or the owl mirror. But it's actually, Nabokovian, yeah. right, very Nabokovian. Whereas the real etymology is uh, very, very uh, vulgar. I, I uh, so uh, the real etymology means um, have, having uh, having sexual intercourse from behind. So it's uh, it's very it's it's something very vulgar and which sound which then gets but sounds very elegant because the original etymology got lost, which is one of the many funny things surrounding surrounding till. Yeah. Yes, and it links in completely with the idea of him being a shape shifting. Yes. Metamorphic character. Even the name is somehow unstable. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Can we, talk a little, can we talk a little bit, Daniel, about um, how you managed to marry historical fiction and you're writing about Elizabeth Virginia, you're writing about Gustav Adolphus, you're writing about the Winter King. You know, we're all historically recognized people. And yet there are supernatural entities woven through the group. And it's something that you did a little bit in some of your previous works, taking historical figures and blending in parts of fiction with them. So just tell me a bit about how you do that. Yeah, that's a very complicated process because you cannot... Um, you cannot do anything with any historical character. For example, I, um, I right after finishing Till, uh, I wrote a, a, a play about uh, the St. Louis. Uh, that, that was a, 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 Jew, a refugee ship, a ship full of refugees, of Jewish refugees in 1939 that tried that, that the Nazis uh, allowed to leave Germany and then no one took it. It, Cuba refused to take it, the US refused it, and they, um, the ship had to go back to, to, to Europe. And the BBC just turned that into a radio play. And the reason I'm mentioning that is when I did this, I, when I did that after Till, I felt I'm telling a story about Jewish refugees in 39. And if the whole point of me doing this is to tell people this happened and you should know about it, then I shouldn't invent anything. And so I did the whole thing as a piece of documentary theater where actually the actors step out of their roles and talk to the audience and tell the audience this happened and it happened because of this and they give explanations. So I did nothing of that sort until because until I felt um, this 
all all these stories and also the history here uh, is so long ago and so remote that it somehow doesn't really matter anymore to the reader what really happened and what didn't. So um, I try to get the details of, of, of life right. I try to get the things right, like did a house have black windows or windows may, or, 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 or open windows or what clothes were people wearing or so I try to be as accurate as possible about the details of daily life, which is very hard because there's a lot of stuff we actually don't know anymore about daily everyday life. But I felt really free to, to, to see somebody like King Gustav Adolf of Sweden, uh, who I think was a terrible warlord, to treat him without any respect and to invent kind of a crazy uh, violent persona for him. So, um, but it's really, there's no, um, and, and, and when I wrote my, my, my first historical novel, Measuring the World, I also felt really th free to invent things about, uh, about Alexander von Humboldt, the great uh, German explorer, because I felt he's, 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 he's such a legendary person and the book is called a novel that I am free to do whatever I want in a certain comedic way. But there is no general rule when you write about, when you use historical characters in your fiction. I think as a general rule of thumb, you lose freedom when you come closer to, to the present. And also, of course, it goes with the genre. In a, in a, in a comedic story, you, you, you're allowed to do more than you are in a, in, in a very dark and, and, and serious tale. Well, I've now moved to get away from the rain, but um, it's quite a kind of rainy story in a way, what you're doing with Till, with the Winter King and the Winter Queen. And again, I don't think a lot of British readers really understand uh, about what was going on with Bohemia at this period, or Prague, or Gustav Dolphus. So what was the intrigue about that? And, and why did you manage to pattern so much of what has been happening here onto uh, the past in terms of refugees, in terms of plagues, in terms of the excluded? Well, let me, let me say two things. First, it's also, it's not, much different for German readers. So the Thirty Years' War is not something that's very present to German readers. There's a certain awareness that it was really, really bad and really, really catastrophic, but people are not aware of any factual details about it if they don't have uh, any special interest in it. So um, I wasn't writing the book for readers who know anything Thing about it and it, it's just uh, it, it was just a background I chose but I was aware of the fact that I would have to make it self-explanatory for all if, if, if at all possible and I think any any novel has to be self-explanatory um, if, it, if it's supposed to work um, the the question of the timeliness uh, that's really something I wanted to keep in the background so I don't like that when People write historical novels and wink at the reader about how much things have changed, have, have, have stayed similar, how things haven't changed, how problems or topics come up again. Um, so I did not want to do the self-conscious winking at the reader. But the thing is that so much happened in the last five years and the patterns of a breakdown of civilized order of civilization, they always look the same or they're always similar. So there are a lot of similarities in how the Thirty Years' War played out and how the Syria conflict played out. And I started this book when the Syria conflict was barely beginning. So uh, you mentioned the, the, the refugees. I have this one uh, paragraph where I describe that uh, the, the search party in, in, in my novel, that they cannot go get into any of the cities because there are so many refugees in southern Germany that the cities close their, uh, their, their doors. 
And I was actually hesitating to include that because I felt like this sounds so much like me attempting to be timely. But then I felt like I cannot not mention it because it is part of the story, but I was it, it was not something I was actively looking for, quite the opposite. But of course, on the other hand, if you're not actively looking for it, but if then the book becomes more timely just because of the things happening in the world, that's of course not great for the world, but it is great for a writer if 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 <laughs> I would still have preferred this for this not to happen, but uh, yeah, as a writer, of course, I, I'm, um, I, I, I like it, but I don't like it as someone who has to live in this world. Ross, if I turn to you now, um, there's a major section in the book where there is a discussion about whether or not German can ever be a literary language. Right. And I want to sort of ask you rather than ask Daniel, how much of that is satire and how much of that is a reflection of what the rest of the world thinks about the German language? Um, that's fair. I mean, I think especially at, historically, it's, it's pretty accurate. It's less satire than even, you know, uh, it, it, there was no German literature until very late. Um, and most German literature, this belated German literature was always... Um, self-conscious about about its belatedness and trying to make up for it maybe by pushing even harder by importing models from France and England um, through translation. Translation played one of the biggest roles in German literature of any other literature because of the belatedness that translation of Shakespeare um, uh, greatly enriched the German language and, and, and the translation, the Luther Bible, basically founded um, um, modern German, the modern German language, the um, uh, the Grimm's attempts to render folklore to collect, but also revise and, and create a folkloric tradition that didn't exist as a written language, and then their dictionary, um, were all kind of uh, uh, founding moments of German literature that relied on kind of um, artifice, invention, recreating the foundations of, of literature that were I mean, and this may be somewhat, you know, I'm not a scholar, so I don't know if this is already an outdated version of the history of German literature, but this is how, I, how I've understood um, um, it. So this writer in the book who, who's part of this discussion is, a, is an actual poet, right, Paul Fleming, who um, Daniel surely knows more about than I do, who, who did write in, in German, which was at the time um, an act of of um, conviction, you know, and an act of um, um, a founding act of, of of something, or an act of um, daring, because because most people would they write in Latin if they were trying to write a poem, or um, what would be Daniel the poetic language that would have been typical at the time? I thought I thought it was French. But then a okay. historian I talked to when I was uh, researching this, this said, no, French, would, it would have been French 50 years later. At uh, that very moment, it would actually have been Italian, which Italian. was surprising to me, but that's what I, what I learned. Right. So he, so he wrote in a beautiful, a beautiful poem. You know, one of the poems that's quoted in the novel, Daniel said to me, it's actually a gorgeous poem. Yes, you know, I, I translated two lines of it because two lines of it are quoted in, in the novel. Um, and I did my own translation, and uh, he mentioned that the poem is really gorgeous, and, and I ended up printing it out and putting it up in my office as a kind of thing to look at because it's it's uh, such a beautiful poem um, by Paul Fleming called um, "On the in, in in itself," or is it or is it in 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 oneself? Anyway, "On the two two ones." Yeah, it's 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 kind of a strange pun. It's, it's to oneself yeah. or in itself. To yeah. one, yeah. It's it's even the title is hard to translate. Right. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So Paul Fleming um, was ahead of his time and was um, uh, part of this effort to give German literary status. Whether it reflects the the eyes of the world now, um, in some kind of stereotype. Yeah, like there, Daniel has a lot of fun with. Um, foreigners like uh, Elizabeth Stewart describing German as a series of grunts and burps and sounding like, you know, um, somebody who drank too much beer. Um, 
So uh, the way the language can sound to foreign ears, uh, you know, flatulent or whatever, um, those kinds of stereotypes are uh, comically rendered in the book as satire. Um, and that some of those stereotypes may still persist in the Anglo-American world. Well, Giv and I did a radio program on the links between Scotland and Germany. And the fact that somebody like Sir Walter Scott begins his career by translating Goethe, mm -hmm. and then uh, well, Goethe and Schiller, and then the Grimms correspond with him. There was a real cultural dialogue, which we seem to have somewhat lost. Um, in the, the in Weir, uh, Willa and Edwin Weir, who did all the Kafka, right? They were Czech. Yes. And Weirs, yes. they were Czech uh, Scott, Scots, right? They were, yeah. But, you know, it, it's strange the way in which, at a time when we all hope that barriers are coming down, it seems that less and less literature and translation is actually reaching our shores. And it's why I want to go back to the political part, because, Daniel, you mentioned the fact that uh, Britain kept itself out of the 30 years war. But from this side of La Manche, it feels very much like an isolationist Britain, a Britain that doesn't want to be involved in Europe. And I wonder how you feel about the ways in which Britain now seems to be going back to that position that was in the Thirty Years' War. I mean, I do think Britain is becoming more and more isolationist. Uh, if, you, if you mention the Thirty Years' War, that is, of course, one of the few moments where the isolationists were right. So that's, uh, that's, that's uh, for us who want internationalism that's not the, the best uh, argument to make <laughs> but uh, I, I I definitely can see how um, well how friends of mine uh, who are from friends from Germany friends from France who live in in, in Great Britain how they feel sad and uh, also how they feel under pressure and how they have a lot of like small everyday, uh, interactions where people just make them feel suddenly that they regard them as foreigners, and uh, and 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 uh, also, of course, I mean, um, part of that is also people that, for example, this this um, stance of the BBC to always be to to not take positions at all. It leads to many people I know, writers from Europe, including myself, happened to myself too giving interviews to the BBC where we are told, oh, no, you can't say that. You can't say we hope Britain will find a way back to Europe. And I'm like, but that's something completely uh, innocuous to say. Like, no, no, you can't say that on the BBC. So it's kind of a both sides thing. On the one, one side, you feel people are becoming more and more um, yeah, isolationist. And on the other hand, where you want people, where you want uh, the forces of enlightenment to make a vigorous argument for internationalism, suddenly uh, many of them don't want to do that anymore. And uh, yeah, that's of course, um, uh, yeah, that's something I, some, some, as someone who spent a lot of time in, in the UK and who has a lot of friends there, uh, this is of course very sad for me to, to, to witness. To return to the book, Perhaps the most moving part for me were the descriptions of Till's father, an autodidact who never wanted to be a miller, who is trying to solve various philosophical problems, like the Sorites problem. At what point does a heap stop being a heap? And there's something very affectionate about the description of him, of somebody who is obviously intelligent, but is excluded from the intelligentsia. What did you feel about writing that character? Why was it important to give Till this strange, eccentric father? I don't really have a good answer to that other than he came to me that way. That was really something I invented. This father is not in any of the, the folk tales. Um, yeah. I was kind of fascinated by the fact how... Um, how 
rigid and static society was. So if you came from a, a poor background, if you came from a peasant background, um, there was just no way for you to become a learned person uh, in, in, in the 17th century. It, it, it was just, uh, and, and so I was moved by the idea, and actually that happened. A lot, of, um, a lot of people who came into conflict with the church and with the Inquisition were actually millers because mil the mill was not part of the village and they were kind of regarded with a certain suspicion. It was, um, the, the, the society had a very, was kind of a caste system, like we, we, we later, like we know from India, where you actually had untouchables. So, uh, for example, the person in charge of, of, uh, of getting rid of the dead or getting rid of dead animals or yeah, yeah. was untouchable. And so also, and millers were not quite untouchable, but they were also not part of good society. So they were not in the village with their families. They were kind of alone. And a lot of them started speculating. And I had this idea of, a, of this man who's very intelligent and tries to understand the world. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, I, 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 I was kind of, of uh that that's how he came to me when I was writing the book well I mean the way in which you parallel um Tilt's father and the executioner who's equally untouchable yeah. I think with extreme grace but Ross I wanted to ask you how much did you know about the history of the Jesuits from Britain who were moving through what will become Germany. So people like Tessamont, who turns up. Right. I'm Scottish Presbyterian, so I had to look it up. <laughs> yeah, I had to look up Tessamont. I didn't know about it when I came across that he was uh, tried as a co-conspirator of the gunpowder plot. I, I had heard of the word gunpowder plot, but I didn't have it situated quite right historically or understand the full significance uh, I, I knew James the first and sixth, um, you know, because of Macbeth and Shakespeare. And uh, but you know, for me, I'm, I'm also American. I figure if, if I had been an English translator of, of this book, um, I would have had a different set of coordinates for some of of of, of the book. But I, I take your word for it that the Thirty Years' War wouldn't have been that present. But you know, the um, the genealogy of the royals and the order of of succession and. Um, but at least, at least these royals, Elizabeth and Mary, Queen of Scots, and and I had no idea that uh, uh, Mary's um, this would be her uh, granddaughter, you know, became the Queen of Bohemia, and that's what what set off the Thirty Years' War. I'd heard of the defenestration of Prague. I knew that was the event of the Thirty Years' War because it had such a um, uh, uh, appealing name, um, the first and second defenestration of Prague, and I I happened to have been abroad in Prague for my junior year of college and learned about, you know, what happened at Prague Castle and during those years. So I had coordinates, but all, none of them, well, um, none of them fully clear in my head. Um, and, you know, one of the great tools that translators have now that they didn't have even a couple decades ago is, is Google. <laughs> I mean, you just have to do so much research for things that come at a single click now. Um, um, so um, it was very easy to get situated. Of course, the book provides most of what you need, um, as a, or all of what you need, really, as a reader to 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 figure out what the historical context for yeah. the context of the book without without historical exposition or anything. It's just um, very um, delicately laid in um, so that you you figure out uh, by the time you finish the book you you have the um, broad in broad strokes you understand you know what happened over those 30 years um, and who was who and so on it, it all becomes crystal clear um, in a way that is so understated that um, uh, you can underestimate actually the the how difficult it is to do that in a book without resorting to expository, long expository passages. So it's really um, one of the brilliant aspects of the book, in my opinion. That uh, uh, that being said, as a translator, you do need to, you do want to research because you want to get the language right. 
um, um, you know, uh, the, the, the elector Palatine, who can also be called the Palsgrave, you know, um, uh, the Count Palatine, the, the, some of the, even the modes of address, certain tradition, they're just sort of standard translations of certain um, modes of address, like his serene highness for an elector. Um, there's a German word for that that would be totally obscure uh, if it didn't ha happen to have an English um, uh, one, but one that had been used over the centuries, you know, to, to describe the same thing. Um, so those, that sort of research becomes necessary for the translator to fill in just to get the, the language right. Um, I, I'd like to pick up on two points about the relationship to um, how the book relates to Great Britain. Uh, and the first one to you, Ross, is there's a very good joke where somebody talks about John Dunn and it's spelled D-U-N <laughs> rather than D-O-N-N-E because he wrote a poem for Elizabeth of Bohemia. How does that work in the German? What's the joke there? That's a, yeah, that's was a very complicated uh, passage to translate. The, the joke in German is that Till, in order to undercut, Elizabeth is, is bragging to Till, because now she has nothing. She's been deposed as Queen of Bohemia. She's in exile. But she's bragging about what she once had, how she was given a gift from the Kaiser, and he asked, where's that now? Did you have to pawn it? You know, And then she said, well, John Donne wrote me, he, he wrote an ode to me where he called me Fair Phoenix Bride. And to basically uh, mess with her and, and, and um, uh, take her off her pedestal, knock her off her pedestal, he pretends to misunderstand the name of the poet and the line in German. They're speaking German to each other, presumably, in the German edition. So he says... Who is Chon Tun? Like he gives it a German pronunciation, it's spelled out sort of phonetically the way he would say it in German. And he says, and what's a, a fair vernix spelled in a German, you know, V-E-R-W-O with an umlaut? What's a fair vernix anyway? And I tried lots of different things, like having him, yeah, misunderstand it in English and so on. But like even in the English edition, one has to presume one they're speaking German to each other. And how is Tilmus? It finally occurred to me that instead of mangling the name of the poet and the, and the line from the poem in, in German, that he could just pretend to mishear it uh, fully in a way that would be um, undercutting. And so I had him say, who is John Dung anyway? Uh, and, and, and who is fearful Nick Bride supposed to be? So just some nonsense that he heard instead of fair Phoenix Bride, fearful Nick Bride. And that was... It, it, there were a lot. There was a lot uh, in between the problem and the solution. But when it finally came, you know, I'd been thinking over for days and days, racking my brain about it. Um, yeah. And Daniel, um, as a kind of walk-on part in the book, we get Elizabeth's memories of Shakespeare. Yes. Uh, later in the week, I'll be interviewing Maggie O'Farrell, who's done her novel about Hamlet. Mm -hmm. the son of Shakespeare and the possible connections with Hamlet. But was it fun to put Shakespeare in, you know, a, just a little cameo role? It was more than fun. It kind of opened the character of Elizabeth for me when I uh, realized that she, Elizabeth Stewart, was the, the only person in 17th century Germany of whom we know that she must have known Shakespeare and seen him perform. And so yes. in a way that, that, that I felt like, okay, what must do, what that must do to somebody to grow up seeing Shakespeare plays performed by Shakespeare and then having to go to this backward place that Germany was back then and her whole sense of theatralic, theatrality. And also out of which she also makes her husband accept that Bohemian crown, which is his biggest political mistake that comes because she likes to be in a Shakespeare play. And in a Shakespeare play, if they offer you a crown, you take the crown, of course. And uh, so I, I loved writing those two or three pages where Shakespeare, without the name ever being mentioned, uh, has a, a cameo. And I really have to say what Ross did there was incredible because it is, it is easier for me to give Shakespeare a few lines to say because I'm writing in German. So it is clear that I'm not as a writer imitating the way 
Shakespeare talks or writes, because there would be, yeah, I, 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 there, there would be something, yeah, very courageous to do. And, but doing it in German, it's still like one language removed from how he would have talked. And, but of course, for the English translation, um, yeah, Ross was not one language removed. So he actually had to make Shakespeare talk for, for a few lines and make it sound like Shakespeare just a little bit, not like an imitation, but just a little bit. And I really, I was really, um, I didn't envy him, but I was very, very impressed by the Shakespeare lines he came up with. <laughs> and we all think we know how Shakespeare spoke or would have sounded, you know. Um, <laughs> We have a sound in our head of cadences and Elizabethan diction, and you know um, that uh, uh, didn't wasn't produced simply by translating the kind of elaborately ornate German version that that Daniel had. It had to be re-rendered with with that with those English rhythms and cadences in mind. And of course, uh poor Shakespeare did think that Bohemia had a coastline. Yeah, yeah, of course, he thought that. Uh, yes. And, and Ingeborg Bachmann, the great German poet, she wrote a beautiful, one of the most beautiful poems of, um, of the 20th century in the German language. She is where she writes about the fact that, of course, Shakespeare was right. If, if, if he tells us Bohemia has a coastline than it does, which is a, a beautiful praise of the power of poetry. Right. You have written in the past about other historical papers like Humboldt, but because we're getting towards the end of our time, I just wondered, would you bring Till back? Do you miss Till? It's a very good question. I do miss him. It was great to spend time in the presence of a mythical character. You've, it, it was really, there's something great and powerful about a mythical character that you have access to as a writer when you use this character and that you lose when you're done with him. And so um, I can tell you, I just agreed to, to uh, write a TV show <laughs> based on the novel. Oh, this. Yes. Part of that was because I wanted to spend some more time in his presence. But I can imagine, you know, given it's a 15th century story that you put into the 17th century, I can imagine Till going right the way through the 18th, the 19th, the 20th, yeah. the 21st, the 27th century. Yeah. Uh, it's such a rich, rich figure. And it's done with such glee is the one word I would use more than any to describe <laughs> it. Uh, it's an absolute triumph. And it's been a real pleasure and a privilege to speak with you both. Uh, Ross, Daniel, thank you. And hopefully at one point I will see you both in Charlotte Square rather than in my rather rainy conservatory. <laughs> thank you both. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much.